The title of my talk is, as already mentioned, Plastic Flow and uh, Fracture in Anisotropic Aluminum Alloys, Experiments, Modeling, and Simulation. Um, I would like to start by um, acknowledging my, my co-workers and colleagues, uh, Susanne Thomason, Björn Håkon Frudal, Asle Tomsta, and Ture Börvik. And we are all at the Structural Impact Laboratory called SimLab at NTNU in, in Trondheim. Uh, so the background for, for this study is the extensive use of aluminum alloys in automotive vehicles. And um, aluminum is used in, in many applications, for instance, in crash safety components, such as the bumper beam, crash boxes, longitudinals, and in frame stru structures. Uh, for instance, in electrical vehicles, it could be the battery trays. And in, in these components um, extruded, uh, aluminum profiles are often used. And this will be the topic of, of this lecture. So the quest for safer and lighter vehicles leads to a need for simulation models that link the microstructure at, at various levels with the structural behavior, and thus um, enable uh, simultaneous um, development of new alloys and, and new structures for, for better safety and lighter vehicles. That's essentially. So, um, so the extrusion process leads to a rather complex microstructure of these extruded aluminum profiles. Uh, we will be studying here the uh, artificially aged 6000 series alloys. Um, so after extrusion, the profiles, they can have typically two different grain structures. It's either a recrystallized grain structure, which has either equaxed grains or slightly elongated grains in the extrusion direction, or the grain structure can be fibrous. So it's essentially non-recrystallized and the grains, they are heavily elongated and they are pancake shaped. Um, these two grain structures, they come with uh, completely different crystallographic textures. So the recrystallized grain structures leads to a recrystallization texture while the fibrous grain structure leads to a deformation texture. And, and these different textures leads to uh, substantial anisotropy in the materials and different anisotropies, as we will see. If we move into the grains, we find uh, the hardening precipitates. These are needle formed uh, particles, uh, nanometer size. And there are many of them, as you can see, you see these uh, this black uh, spots here. These are the, the hardening precipitates. And around uh, the grain boundaries, we have uh, precipitate-free stones. So these are soft zones without uh, precipitates. And, and these zones, they, they can be um, quite important for the ductility in, in some cases. And these zones, they can be around 100 nanometer, maybe up to 1,000 nanometer in, in some cases. And then we have also constituent particles. So, so these particles are bigger, around one micrometer large. And it's around these particles that voids nucleate and grow and coalesce and, and lead to a ductile fracture. And what we see here is, is a typical fracture surface with dimples. And we see these constituent particles in the bottom of the dimples. And we see that some of them have cracked. And this cracking typically uh, can take place either during the extrusion process or it could be during the deformation afterwards. So in summary, a, a rather complex uh, microstructure. Um, so there are essentially three types of anisotropy that uh, affect the ductility of the extruded profiles. So first we have the morphological anisotropy, which is linked to the shape of grains and the shape of, of the constituent particles. We saw that uh, if you have this fibrous grain structure, the grains are very flat, and obviously then we have an anisotropy. Uh, then we have the plastic anisotropy that is linked to crystallographic texture. And this is anisotropy in, in yield strength and anisotropy in the plastic flow of the material. And finally, we have the topological anisotropy, which is linked to the spatial distribution of the constituent particles. Uh, due to the extrusion process, they often line up along the extrusion direction, and this is called a stringer. So there's a kind of a clustering that leads to also an anisotropy. So the research aim of this work has been to perform a detailed study of the effects of the plastic anisotropy 
on the anisotropy of the tensile ductility of extruded aluminum profiles. And we do this by combining experiments, um, characterization of the material, and mechanical testing with modeling. And, and uh, here we have looked at a crystal plasticity formulation coupled with um, a simple damage model. And then we do CPFEM simulations um, to investigate the, uh, the effect of, of the plastic anisotropy on the ductility. So we have selected three alloys. Uh, these are relatively high strength alloys and they are um, relevant for automotive applications. So the alloys are uh, the 6061, 6063 and 6110 alloys. Uh, here, the two first, they have a recrystallized grain structure, while the latter one, 6110, has a fibrous grain structure. And 6063 is the, the leanest alloy. You can see this on the magnesium and silicon content here. And if you look at the stress strain curves up to, to failure of these materials, we see that 6063 has the lowest strength, 6110 the highest strength, and 6061 is average. While these two alloys, 6061, 6063, they are recrystallized, while this one is fibrous. Um, so we have uh, looked at extruded profiles of six millimeter thickness and 40 millimeter width. And we define then uh, three directions. So they, these are essentially the principal axis of anisotropy. So it's the extrusion direction ED, the transverse direction TD, and the normal direction ND. And all materials were artificially aged to uh, 36, which is the, the peak strength uh, condition of, of these materials. So this slide shows the grain structure that we obtained after uh, extrusion. And we see uh, recrystallized grain structures for the two left alloys here. They're indicated by red color, so they are recrystallized, while the right one, the blue color, is fibrous. And if you look at 6061 first, we see that we have elongated grains. They are not as big as it seems here because we have a, um, the contrast is a bit uh, low. So there might be several grains that have almost the same contrast, but we find this in, in EBSD. So, so, but they are, they're elongated, but it's a recrystallized grain structure. And the grain size here is between 34 micron in the ND direction up to 97 in the ND direction. So we have elongated grains. Uh, for the 6063, typical uh, recrystallized structure with equiax grains around 30 to 40 micron. And then we have in this structure, it's, it's almost impossible to, to find a grain size in ED and TD because we have these pancake shaped, very long grains that could be even millimeter size long. But in the ND, in the thickness direction, they are around four micron. And inside this grain, we have subgrains, so with very close orientation. So we have very different and quite complex uh, microstructures of these materials. Then to the crystallographic texture. So, so this slide shows the orientation distribution functions and, and they give the, the micro, macro texture of this material. And we see here clearly that the two recrystallized materials, they have very similar texture very strong texture. And the texture components are a cube and goss, uh, while for the, uh, the non-recrystallized fibrous material, we have a deformation texture. And the texture components are cube, uh, brass, uh, copper, and S. So these are the orientations along the so-called uh, beta fiber. So it's a typical deformation texture. So this texture is somewhat weaker than what we see for the recrystallized materials. Remember, this is the material with the flat elongated grains. These are the material with uh, equiaxed or elongated, slightly elongated grains. Um, th so this slide shows the constituent particles. We clearly see that they uh, align up in, in stringers. Uh, along the extrusion directions. We have area fractions spanning from below 0.5% up to 0.8% for 6110. And we also have shown here the area, uh, no, sorry, the, the particle size distribution of, of, the, um, of the constituent particles. 
And we see that uh, 6061 has a lower or smaller particles, while uh, 6110 has the largest particles of, of the three alloys. But the differences are not very large. And we see the average size is around about one micrometer. So, so these are the important particles for, for duct type fracture. Uh, you can also see, if you look very closely, that there are some speckles here in the 6110 alloy, and these are the dispersoids, and they are there to, to hinder recrystallization in this material. So these are smaller, around about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 micrometer. <clears throat> so then to the mechanical testing. So we did um, a tensile test on smooth and notched samples, uh, and we did tests in in different directions in the plane of the extrusion. So for the smooth specimens, as I've shown here, we did five different directions with respect to the extrusion direction. While for the notch specimens, we did three directions. So zero, 45, and 90. And so we have uh, introduced notches here with different radius to, to have different stress states in, in the tensile tests. And uh, in order to uh, probe the ductility of the materials, uh, we use a laser extensometer to measure the minimum diameter of the specimen continuously uh, along two orthogonal directions all the way to fracture. So, so this way we can establish average true stress, true strain curve at the minimum cross section to fracture, which is important uh, as we want to look into ductility and, and the, um, the plastic anisotropy of, of the materials. So, here you can see the, the tensile behavior that we obtained for the three materials. Um, firstly, uh, we can see that the behavior is quite complex. Uh, we see a lot of different anisotropies. Uh, but before we go into the anisotropy, I will just comment the notch effect. So if you look at these curves, we have five curves here. They are the um, representative uh, stress strain curves obtained on the smooth specimen. Then for the shallowest notch and the sharpest notch. And you see there is a very strong notch effect on the ductility. So, so on the ductility. So that obviously the triaxiality plays a strong role on the ductility of this material. And this effect is stronger for the recrystallized materials than for the non-recrystallized materials. Okay, then to the anisotropies that we see. We see initial anisotropy in yielding in all materials. We see strong anisotropy in the st strain at failure. And these crosses, they mark the point where the curve starts to drop. So it's essentially the peak true stress that we are showing here. And we see that we have anisotropy. And then, especially for the recrystallized material, we have a very strong anisotropic hardening. While this is less uh, obvious for the uh, fibrous material. And it should be noted that this anisotropic hardening it consists of what we would say well, is the ordinary hardening. Then we have texture evolution, but we also have a structural effect because this is the true stress. So it's just a force divided by the current area. So we have also the effect of netting here. So we have a superimposed triaxial stress field that will raise the, the stress after necking. But anyhow, we see this very strong, especially for the 6063 alloy, a very strong anisotropic hardening that we will see is linked to to the texture and the texture evolution. Now, if you look uh, closer into the plastic anisotropy in strength and plastic flow, to do this, we uh, consider the stress ratio and the strain ratios. And they are shown here as a function of the tensile direction. And this is for the smooth specimens. So the stress ratio is simply um, a ratio of the flow stress in a certain direction, alpha, divided by the flow stress in the extrusion direction, so alpha equal to zero. And, and this ratio is then taken at um, a given specific plastic work. And in this case, it's uh, around yielding, so it's a plastic work, um, or it's a plastic strain of around 1%. Um, and what we see is that the variation of this stress ratio is very similar for the two recrystallized material and completely different for the non-recrystallized material. And we see that the degree of anisotropy is about 10% in both cases, essentially. Um, so this gives the anisotropy in yield strength. Then we have the anisotropy in plastic flow, which is defined by the strain ratio. It's also called the R value or the Langford coefficient. So it's defined as, as the ratio of 
the incremental plastic strain in the width direction of the specimen divided by the uh, incremental plastic strain in the thickness direction of the specimen. And for a material that is isotropic, this ratio would be equal to one. And we see that for the two recrystallized materials, we have very similar distribution. And the ratio is not close to one. Uh, well, it's close to one only in the extrusion direction, it's 0 0.7. But we see, for instance, in the 45 degree direction, it's, it's very low, 0 0.15, something like that. And in the transverse direction, it's uh, about three. So we have an extraordinary strong anisotropy in the plastic flow. So how the plastic flow um, is oriented, essentially. Um, the distribution is, uh, or the anisotropy is also strong for the fibrous material, and the distribution is different, but it's not as strong as for the recrystallized material, as we can see. It's closer to, to unity in this case. Uh, just to, um, to show uh, the uh, anisotropy that we obtain from, from these measurements, I'm showing here the, um, uh, the yield surfaces, the YLD 2004-18P yield surfaces obtained based on uh, the measured stress and strain ratios. So this is for 60-63 and this is for 61-10. And what I'm showing here is essentially the yield surface in plane stress. So this is sigma 1, 1 is in extrusion direction, sigma 2, 2 in the transverse direction. And then we have shear coming out of the plane. And we see the, the big difference between the shapes of these two yield surfaces, indicating the strong difference in, in strength and plastic flow. And for instance, the peak normalized shear stress is very high for the recrystallized material and rather low for the non-recrystallized. 0.5 would be a Tresca type material. So here is 0.53. While here it is 0.76, which is way above a von Mises type material. So there is obviously a very strong plastic anisotropy. We are not going to use these yield surfaces, they're just for, uh, for an illustration here. Okay, and then to a major result is it's the anisotropy in tensile utility or the failure strain. And we have defined the failure strain as the strain at the maximum true stress. So it's, it's not the fracture strain, not, not when the, the specimen goes into two parts. So it's when, it, when softening initiates. And we, we have used this measure because it's, uh, we have better accuracy on, on this measurement because after softening initiates, everything goes very quickly and it's, it's hard to measure and, and so on. And it, so all the measurements, all the simulations become very sensitive to, to meshes and so on. Okay, so if you look at the distribution of, of the failure strain versus the tensile direction, again, this is for the, for the smooth specimens, we see similarities between the two recrystallized materials, but not to the same extent as we saw for the, for the plastic anisotropy. While we have a clearly different distribution for the fibrous material. Now, the low um, failure strain in the 90 degree direction for the 60-61 material compared with the 60-63 material, we assume is linked to the, this, the, the elongated grain of this material. Um, so this is we, we believe that this is an effect of, um, of um, morphological anisotropy. We will see later from the simulation that the distribution for 6063 is strongly related to plastic anisotropy. In the same holes to a large extent for 6110. But anyhow, we have a strong um, variation in ductility with direction. And we see it goes from a strain of one to 100% uh, down to, uh, 0 0.75, so 75%, for instance, for the 60-63 material. The anisotropy is less for the 61-10 material. And this uh, view graph shows uh, the fracture surfaces, I'm showing this only for 60-63, for the three different directions of the smooth specimens and the notch specimens. And we see that, that we have this oval shape, uh, and, uh, and the ellipse is essentially oriented in different direction. And, uh, and this is due to the plastic anisotropy and it's driven by, by the R, R values or the, the strain ratios essentially. And we see we have a strong anisotropy. And then we show the similar results for the notched specimen with, this, with the sharpest notch. So in the extrusion direction, and the specimen is almost round. In the 45 degree direction, it is slightly elliptic. Then in the 90 degree direction, we get this diamond shape of the fracture surface. 
So we see this a complexity here that is introduced by by uh, by the plastic flow and and also how the plastic flow is influenced by the stress state, uh, either in a smooth specimen that necks or in a notch specimen with a much sharper notch. So so yeah, a very complex behavior. However, when it comes to the fract um, the fracture mode, and we show here the fractography, we see for all materials a classic dimple structure. So typical. The, the failure mode is, is, is nucleation, growth, and coalescence avoids. We see some large uh, oversized dimples that typically uh, we have seen um, nucleate often between or on the boundary of two grains and they grow into to, to two grains. And, and uh, these can, we think, often be where the fracture initiates. Uh, in the 6063 alloy that is slightly high on silicon, we find also some areas with facets that indicate into granular fracture, but, but this is not very extensive. Okay, so then to the, the simulation part. Um, so we have used crystal plasticity um, and the, the model we have used has been formulated for explicit finite element analysis. It's, it's a quite standard crystal plasticity model and, and the equations of, of this type of model has have already been, been um, uh, shown in, in previous presentations, I'm only showing the equations on, on the slip system level, essentially. So we use a, a, the standard viscoplastic constitutive relation giving the, the slip rate or the shear strain rate on slip system alpha as a function of the resolved shear stress on this slip system. Uh, tau C is the slip resistance. Uh, uh, gamma dot not is a re reference shear strain rate and M is a, a rate sensitivity parameter. The slip resistance is uh, evolves according to, to this equation, where, where theta is the self-hardening modulus, which is depending on the accumulated um, shear strain. And then Q alpha beta is the latent hardening matrix. Uh, and the self-hardening modulus is defined by our Voce type saturation law in terms of the, um, the accumulated shear strain. So, so there is nothing special uh, about this um, this model. It's implemented in uh, quite efficiently using an explicit integration scheme with substepping, which is quite uh, suitable for explicit finite element analysis where the time steps are, are, are very small. Now, in order to, to model fracture, we have uh, introduced a damage coupling and we are using a, a completely heuristic approach. Um, so we introduce an effective stress tensor, which is simply the Cauchy stress divided by one minus the um, the damage variable omega and then to couple damage we substitute in the crystal plasticity equations the stress by the effective stress now the damage evolves according to to this evolution rule which is uh, motivated as you can see by the gerson model or the rice tracy model so the um, the damage evolves um, um, or is driven by the rate of the, the accumulated shear strain and then it's amplified by the stress triaxiality. And we have two parameters, Q1 and Q2, that ha have to be, be fitted to experiments. And fracture is assumed to occur when we have a critical value of the damage parameter, so omega C. And this the fracture is, is, um, takes place here by element erosion. And all simulations, they are done in abacus explicit. So um, in order to be able to run simulations of the mechanical test, uh, we have to use coarse models. We want to use crystal plasticity um, to do the simulations. So what we've done is to use uh, models with one element per grain, which is very rough, of course. But we want to um, capture the heterogeneity introduced by the different orientations of the grains. And we want to capture the marker texture. Um, and we use eight node hex, hex elements. And the models that we use, they are shown here on top of the, uh, of the, the specimen geometries. And the characteristic element size in the gauge re region is uh, around about 30 micrometer. And we use the same, uh, roughly the same um, element size in all simulations to avoid problems with, um, with um, mesh sensitivity. Since we are going into the softening regime, we could, uh, we could have this pattern 
logical uh, mesh dependence, or we will probably have it at, at the later stage in the simulation. Um, so we have to identify the parameters. Uh, I have um, divided them into two uh, categories, uh, the blue parameters and the red parameters. The blue parameters um, corresponding to elasticity, rate dependence, and latent hardening, they are taken from literature, it's characteristic values for aluminum alloys, while these red param parameters that are uh, governing yielding and self-hardening and damage, they are uh, obtained by inverse modeling. And for this, we use um, a tension test on the smooth specimen and one of the notch specimens in the transverse direction. So we're using two of the specimens for this calibration. And then we get a set of parameters. I'm not going into details here, but all the details are given in, in the paper that is referred to here in, in plasticity. Okay, so, so these are some simulation results. It shows the, the stress strain uh, curves along TD for the 6063 and 6110. We did not, we have not done uh, simulations on 6061. Um, the computation times uh, are quite large. So uh, they spend between about 10 days up to 30 days on this type of, of computer. So, so we couldn't do too many, uh, too many of these simulations. Anyhow, you see that uh, the simulations in gray here, they capture the main trends seen in the experiments. Obviously, these, these two uh, curves here, they have been fitted. So uh, it's no wonder there's a rather good um, um, agreement. While for the, the sharpest notch, this is a prediction essentially. It's quite good for the fibrous material, 6110. We are overshooting um, the stress level for the recrystallized material. And this is something we have seen before uh, when we have used other models, for instance, uh, anisotropic plasticity model, that we tend to, to overshoot the stress level for, for the recrystallized materials. It might be due to the very sharp notch uh, and um, the sharpness of the notch compared with the, the grain size. But we have not been able to, to establish what is the reason for this. And then one of the main results, this shows the, the failed specimen um, with tension along the uh, transverse direction. And this is again for 6063, the recrystallized alloy that had a very strong um, texture. So we see the, the failure surfaces from the experiments to the right. Then we see them in profiles here, the failed specimens, and the simulations to the left. And we can see that. Um, even if we are using a rather rough um, mesh size or a large mesh size and on the rough models, we're able to capture the main characteristics seen in experiments. So we get the oval shape in the smooth specimen, we get the diamond shape uh, for the notch specimen that we see experimentally, and we get also this tendency of orange peel or roughness that we see in the experiments, and also the fracture surfaces are quite well captured. Then. Um, the simulations of uh, the smooth specimens of 6063 in all directions. Uh, experiments to the left, simulations to the right. Uh, we see that by only accounting for, for the texture, uh, we capture the main trends. There is one significant difference is that we underestimate the yield stress in the extrusion direction. And, and not only the yield stress, but the, the, the flow stress essentially. And um, we have, this is, um, the, the reason for this is that we see that the, especially the yield stress in the extrusion direction is very sensitive to the, um, um, to the aging of the material. So the, the relation between the yield stress in the extrusion direction compared with the yield stresses in the other direction uh, changes with the artificial aging. And obviously this we are not able to, to uh, include when we're only in looking into texture. But we see we have this very strong uh, texture evolution in the 45 degree direction. And also the main trends are captured except for uh, the result in the, in, this, in the zero degree or the extrusion direction. So this shows the, the um, plastic anisotropy from simulations and um, experiments, again, for 6063. If we start with the, the R value or the strain ratio, we see that we get a very good fit. So, so the anisotropy in plastic flow is mostly defined by the, um, uh, by, by, by the texture of the material. When it comes to the 
the stress ratio or the normalized yield stress, we have the correct trend. But you see that the, the points are slightly displaced. And the reason for this is that we have normalized with the yield stress in the extrusion direction that was off. And the reason for that this is off is essentially that we have this sensitivity here to the aging of the material. Apart from that, the trend is not at all bad. If you look at the anisotropy of the failure strain, and now I'm showing results for both 6063 and 6110, so the, the recrystallized and the fibrous material, you see that the simulations are really able to capture for the 6063 very nicely the uh, anisotropy and failure strain seen in the experiment. So remember here, uh, this was the material with equiax grains. And it seems that for this material, the failure strain, uh, the variation of the failure strain with the tensile direction is mostly determined by uh, the texture and the texture resolution. While uh, for the, um, the material with the flat pancake-shaped grains, uh, we have the trends, but we see that uh, there is a stronger anisotropy in the experiments. And, and this is probably related to the morphological anisotropy that we have for, the, for this material. But still, you know, we see that there is a, in the simulations, the, the distribution is very different in the two cases. So, so the, the texture and its evolution is, is, is very important. And then uh, again, for this, the, for 6063, show the, the failed specimens from simulations and, and experiments. And we see a qualitatively very good agreement um, between the, the, the simulations and experiments, even if in some cases we overestimate the, the degree of anisotropy. That the reason is that we have a slightly lower, uh, we predict a lower strain ratio for, for the 45 degree direction in the simulations than what we measured in the experiment. And then we see this effect. Um, okay only uh, all, uh, almost at the end. So uh, this shows the, the failed specimens in profile, again, from the same material. I wanted to show this just to highlight the, the point that when we, we pull the material outside the, the, uh, the principal axis of anisotropy, we will induce shear due to the anisotropy. And, and this leads to different failure modes. They, they don't look very nice, these big, but that, that's due to very elongated elements. And, and the erosion process. But you see, if you go back up one slide, if you see it uh, from, on, you know, edge on, it looks uh, pretty nice and similar to the experiment. Okay, then I'll come to the concluding remarks. So the anisotropy in yield stress plastic flow and hardening is primarily determined by the crystallographic texture and differs substantially for materials with recrystallized and non-recrystallized uh, microstructure. The anisotropy in tensile ductility also appears to be largely determined by the crystallographic texture and its evolution, of course, for this material. But we also see that there are other uh, effects uh, at play here. The CPFAM simulations with one element per grain demonstrate um, the importance of microtexture uh, on the anisotropy in plastic flow and fracture of these extruded materials. So thank you for your attention. So thanks very much for this nice talk. <clears throat> so the talk is open for discussion now. Yes, Lorenzo. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, let me try the camera, but I, I have a bad connection, so I don't know whether I can try the, the camera. Anyway, the question is, um, do you know whether the anisotropy should uh, become uh, more relevant uh, if you have smaller grains. So in talking about size effects, are they relevant for this kind of uh, problems? Um, the, well, um, the, I don't know if the, and I sort of, well, what I think is that if you, um, if you have smaller grains, then I believe that the um, morphological anisotropy, I mean, the effect of the morpho morphological anisotropy will be less. We, um, we see yes, that- sir. Yeah, less because if you have larger grains, you know, you tend to get grain boundary fracture. So, I mean, if you have long grains and you pull transversely to these grains, you have a lot of grain boundaries and soft zones. And this leads to a very strong anisotropy in, in, in the fracture strain. But if you're talking about the anisotropy or the plastic anisotropy, 
I, I don't know. We haven't really looked into that. And you know, our model doesn't have a size effect, and that's obviously a weakness. Sure. Yeah. I, so. I, I was per, perhaps incorrectly in thinking that uh, uh, smaller grains uh, require more GNDs, uh, and GNDs should bring some anisotropy. But perhaps uh, I don't know. I was just curious to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see your point. I see your point. I, I don't know, honestly. We, we haven't um, tried to to look into this uh, experimentally uh, and, and not sim by simulation. Either. Okay. So, mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? I have actually a question. <clears throat> but in all models, uh, you use the same grain structure, right? One element per grain. And for the elongated case, you didn't consider the morphology at all. No. In the no. Simulations, but just the param from the parameters and the macroscopic behavior you identified, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. We, we used the, the only effect that we included um, was the, the macro texture. So, so we didn't at all account for, for the grain morphology in these simulations. And for the grain uh, orientation, uh, I mean, you are distributing the orientation in these elements. Mm. In each case, is it like random or you distribute according to the texture? Uh, according to the texture. texture. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's the macro texture. So, so we, we are not accounting for, 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 for um, misorientations between the grain. So, so we have the correct macro texture, and that, that was the only thing we, we, we were able to account for, you know, because um, if you go to these uh, materials with these flat elongated grains, they have uh, subgrains that are only, let's say, four or five micron large. And, you know, if we went down to this element size, the, the simulation would take a year or something like mm. that. So, so it, it's really not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So there is one more question from Elat Priya. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I'm sorry I'm not opening the camera, but it doesn't work in this computer. But uh, one short question. Um, you showed a comparison between the uh, uh, failure in the experiments and failure in the model. Uh, but what I don't understand is usually uh, in, in these types of uh, aluminum alloys and other metals, uh, failure is the result of uh, void formation, void coalescence, and finally fracture. Yeah. And if I understand correctly, your model does not uh, incorporate void uh, initiation, growth, or coalescence. So how can you capture um, the uh, what seems to be very uh, exact representation of the uh, fracture surface uh, without incorporating yeah. void growth? Yeah, well, we are incorporating it in a, in a simplified manner through this uh, this uh, damage, so we have a damage coupling. Mm. So, oh. so we are softening material. I, I mean, well, I didn't say that maybe, but uh, we um, we neglect nucleation here. So we assume essentially that uh, we have an initially void volume fraction or damaged, or let's call it damage, that relates to the, 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 the particle or the area fraction of the constituent particle. Mm -hmm. And then from this, the, the, the damage grows up to a critical level, which is around 0 0.12, and that was calibrated. And oh, you see okay. that this growth is similar to what you would find if you do uh, um, in a porous plasticity model, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so it's, it's a heuristic way of including for some of the effects. We also have a model that is based on homogenization, and where we really have porous crystal plasticity. The problem is that then you need to do iterations on the slip level, and the, the computation time is um, it's almost 10 times, I think. So that means that our simulations would be 100 days to almost a year. So, so, so this is at, at present, this is the best we can do. Yeah, but I it's, it's, it's clearly it's, it's approximate. But, but you know, these kind of damage models, it's essentially like a Lumetta damage model with slightly different evolution rule. These have been used a lot and with quite good success. So, and it seems to work work well yeah okay thank you okay thanks any other question so i see no other question so we thank you again professor Verstadt. thanks thank a lot